Sometimes things don't go as planned, and what seemed like a good idea at the time is maybe not such a good idea in hindsight. The video that I had planned to do and upload yesterday is an example of that. And that was our railroad spike tomahawk that I had mentioned that I would work on. And I started working on it, and I could tell pretty quickly into the video that I was going to have some issues. I modified a tool a little bit, and I'll explain that here in just a minute, and continued on, and it looked like I might have success, but because of the material and how thin the eye and the tomahawk was, I ended up cracking the eye. And I'll show you a close-up of what happened and talk about exactly what it was, and show you a little bit of that video that I was taking at that time. So we're going to have to start over. I'm going to modify the tool a little bit more, but let's take a look at what the problem is. So the plan, of course, was to start with a railroad spike and turn it into a little tomahawk using the, the punch that we had made the other day. Now the punch that we made had a pyramid-shaped point, and this one is, no, is, is the same punch, but it's been modified a little bit now. And that pyramid point was just pushing through and then you turn it over and you push through from the back and turn it, and it was just pushing the same thin membrane back and forth. It was never shearing any kind of a slug out, it never poked through, so I modified the punch into a slot punch that fit right in where it had been, been pushing back and forth like that. And that did punch an acceptable hole, but it really ended up making the eye quite thin in the process, and really kind of messed it up and made it kind of an ugly little eye. I don't know if you can see that or not. But the other problem I had was I need to upset this. And I chose to upset it after doing the eye, and I explained that in a little bit of video I'll show here shortly. And when I did that, that put enough stress on the eye to crack it because it was so thin. So there's a couple of things I think we need to do different to pull this off. The first one, I think this would be better as a slitting chisel for something this small than any kind of a punch. This is just su such thin material, I think probably better off just chiseling a slot in there, and I'm going to reforge this today, and after we see what went wrong with this, we'll get into forging that, and we'll make a slitting chisel out of it instead. And then the other thing I think I need to do different is we're going to have to upset it first, and then we'll have to deal with the fact that it's got a fat end on both sides, but this needs to be tight down to the anvil, which it doesn't want to do because it'll be supported by the fat spots. So we'll have to make a little block or find a scrap that fits and holds that up in the air for us. So that's just a brief overview of what went wrong. Let's go back to yesterday and watch it as it happened and you can see the, the mistakes as I did them, and then we'll come back and we'll worry about reforging our punch into a slitting chisel and hope that that works better, and then in the next video we'll get back to it. I'm going to set the head down inside the hardy hole there, and that way it won't get deformed. Find my punch mark. Start light, make sure you're where you want to be. You could still correct it at this point. And that's as far as I'm going to go to start with. I want to make sure I've got a good mark on both sides before I obliterate my center punch mark. And now we'll reheat. And we'll get a little bit more serious about it. I'm just taking a look pretty much every blow just to make sure things look like they're going the way I want them to. smaller bar cools off fairly quickly, so we're going to have to get it hot 
regularly, but we're close to halfway through there. Seems like I'm just a little off, so I'm going to see if I can tip the punch and steer it the way I want it to go here. Looks a little thin on this side, a little fat on that side. And dipping the punch in quick and dirty tool works punch lube to cool it and to make sure it doesn't get stuck. You can put coal dust in there, dip it in water, graphite. There's a lot of different things you can use to keep a punch from sticking. I'm starting to push kind of a web of material back and forth in here, which is a problem with this style punch that I've had before. That's the reason I so often just use a regular slot punch. Yeah, let's see if we can punch all the way through that this time. So another case of uh, if you do this all the time you make better tools that are just made for it. But we will get through there. through but the slug did not shear out as nicely as I would have liked so I'm going to have to work that off and get rid of that slug. I'm going to push that slug back into the hole and then drive it back through with the punch hopefully and shear off the part that didn't shear the first time. slug down in the bolster there so that's sheared off and we got a hole through there. I've kind of deformed this hopefully we can fix that. I'm not as impressed with that as I would like to be. As I mentioned that pyramid punch I've had trouble with in the past. I keep trying to give them a fair shake because a lot of people really like them but I ended up grinding that flat and I think if I had done that right from the beginning, we would have been better off. And a smaller punch with a flat end, just a real small slot punch, I think would have been ideal for this. I'm just not real impressed with that pyramid-shaped punch. Now before I do anything else with the eye, I want to upset this end some. I could have upset the end before doing the, the eye. And it would have been better in a lot of ways, but I couldn't have set it flat on the anvil here. I would have had that upset, and I would have had to force it down and bow it each time, or have a block to set it on, and I just thought that was too much trouble. So I'm going to upset it later. I'm going to try not to get the eye hot, and just get the part that I want upset hot. I can't quench this, because it's hardenable steel, and if I quench and it's an oil hardening steel, so if I quenched it in water to cool this part off, I would probably crack it. Let's see how this goes. It's deforming horrible. Oh, up. I broke it. Yep, so much for that project. Hopefully that little clip explained somewhat what went wrong and you can see the problem that I was having with that that pyramid shaped punch. I've seen a lot of people use punches like that. They seem to have great success with it. A lot of people advocate for that style punch. I've seen them used as press punches with a fly press or a hydraulic press. 
I've seen that shape punch used under a power hammer, hand punches at the anvil, and people have good luck with it. But this is not my first time trying it, and I've never had good luck with that style punch. So either my geometry is slightly off on the punch, and I need to find somebody that's got a handful of them that I can study firsthand. Although I have seen some other people's punches, and mine sure seemed like it was the same thing. But there may also be some technique difference, or maybe it's just the smaller material doesn't like to punch that way. It's hard to say, but uh, I think I'm going to probably go back to using all flat bottom punches or slitting chisels and not worry about that kind of hybrid style slitting punch sort of a thing. Uh, it just doesn't seem worth it to me. The others work so well that I'm not sure that it's worth my trouble to try and and figure that out when I already know I can get good results with a, a flat bottom punch. But now we need to turn this punch, because I still think that this is too much punch for this, into a slitting chisel. It's going to be pretty easy. We're just going to draw it out. Then we'll file or grind it to make it look like a chisel. Now this punch had previously been hardened and tempered, and therefore it has stress in it. So the first thing I'm going to do is just bring it up to heat and let it normalize or slow cool in air until it's down below black heat again and then I'll heat it up and forge it. And that may not be necessary, just heating it up to forge it may take enough stress out of it, but I really don't want to crack it at this point. Don't need two failures in a row, so I'm going to take the extra step, let it normalize, let it de-stress, and then we'll be ready to forge it. This may just be a one heat modification here. All we really need to do is just draw it out to a chisel point. Nice long taper. And around the edges up again. And I'll explain exactly what shape I want when we get to the, the finishing part of this. That's really all I want to do. It's down to not quite a point. We'll grind and file the point on. I've started to round up the edges. And I'll show you what that looks like. We've covered the hardening and tempering process. And while I'll continue to do that to a large degree, I'm not going to worry about it with this one. So we'll get back to this and discuss how I shape and grind the slitting chisel for this purpose. And I'll just go ahead and harden and temper it, and then we won't kill any more video time with that. At least not today. We will in the future. Well, that turned out to be a very simple tool to modify. We just need to file it and clean it up now. on a smooth surface so it goes through fairly easily. And of course I've cut a lot of this out of the video just to keep it from being too boring. Now on the edges I'm going to want to sharpen this down just about a quarter of an inch or so, so it does start to cut on the edges, but then I want them to transition to round. And a lot of that I probably will wait to do after it's hardened. So I'm just going to start doing the rounding now. This will leave a nice smooth transition that won't propagate into a stress crack if it's round as it goes through. At least that's my hope. And on the top I want it curved. I want a kind of a high spot right in the middle that's going to help me line this up and get my slit started right where I want. And I'll wait to file the bevel or grind a bevel after it's hardened. So that's really all I need to do to this. It's time to harden and temper it. That'll be exactly the same as what we did previously.
Did you ever just have one of those days, or maybe it was two of those days back to back where things just don't go right? Well, I started this video yesterday with the intent of making a finished product, and then I picked it back up again this morning with the intent of showing you how I was going to readjust and redo a tool to make the second attempt of that product so that we fix the failure from yesterday. But I'm going to end the video this afternoon with a second failure. And you can't see this on the camera, it's too fine to see, but I reforged the chisel, dressed it, hardened it, tempered it, and what I find is a great big crack running right down the center of this, about two-thirds of the way down on one side. It doesn't go to the other side, so it's not a complete crack all the way through, but it's completely unusable. It would be foolish to try to use it. It would be unsafe. You hit this with a hammer, it might undramatically fall into two pieces. It might last a year. Who knows? Or it might break into multiple pieces and send stuff flying around the shop, and that's really dangerous. So there's no reason to even take a chance or experiment with it any further. This is a second failure on this project, and this one's going into the scrap heap with the other one. But we're going to persist. We're going to figure out how to get it done. They say you sometimes learn more from your mistakes than you do from your successes. While in generally that's sort of vaguely true, I don't always agree with it. But have we learned something? Or have I learned something? Well, yesterday I learned two things. I learned that the style of punch I created was probably not the best style for the job, and I think I could do a better job with a slitting chisel. And I learned that I don't want to upset that thin eye in a hardenable steel like 5160 while well, I'm upsetting that end, I'm going to have to upset the end first. So those two things I learned. Today, what, we've, what I have learned is that this punch was made out of salvaged steel. It was made out of an old piece of coil spring that was straightened and reforged a square, made into a punch, hardened and tempered. So it was hardened and tempered as a coil spring, put through an entire lifetime of whatever use it served until it was deemed unusable, and removed from the vehicle. Then it was made into a tool, hardened and tempered the second time, and it held up. It was fine. But doing it the third time, there was just too much stress. Something didn't go right. And that's one of the risks of using salvaged steel. I have no idea what stress this has been through previously. This could be from some of that stress. It could be I didn't relieve enough stress when I normalized it prior to forging it. Maybe I should have annealed it. There's still some unknowns there, but the big lesson for me, I believe, is just another example of why used tool steels or used steels to make tools out of have their problems. It's still, still doable, but just be aware of it and don't make stuff out of this old steel to send out to customers. I know there are people out there that that's their marketing is repurposed and made into something new but, boy, there's a risk there, and you don't want this failing in a customer's hands. So, instead of this, what I have done, and I'm not going to show it because it only takes me about 10 minutes to do it when I'm not doing a video of it, I have drawn out a piece of new S7 tool steel. It was a three-quarter inch drill rod. Drew it out to half inch square, cut off a three inch piece of it, forged a new slitting chisel out of that three inch piece of S7. It is annealing as we speak and tomorrow when it is cooled I will grind it. I think things will go much better. Trying to save a buck, trying to take shortcuts isn't always the best thing. On the other hand, if you have a tool that isn't working right, it's okay to reforge it into something else. Just be aware that every time you reforge, reharden, retemper, you're changing the way the steel's been stressed and you start to get micro fractures at some point that you can't see but ultimately result in a failed tool and this is a failed tool. So we have two failures there today, or one yesterday, one today. Um, back to learning from failures. And this is something I really hadn't meant to address today but I think I will. It seems quite common out there in internet forums, online, uh, discussions with 
newer blacksmiths particularly, that you learn more from failures than you do from successes. And as I said earlier, I don't really believe that's true. I think your future success is built on your past success. And there will be failures built into that. You're going to fail. You're going to have mistakes. You're going to have a lot of trial and error. But failure is not the goal. When you read these online forums, you find people all the time telling the brand new guy, just go out there and beat iron. You'll make a lot of mistakes. You'll fail. You'll screw stuff up. But you're going to learn a lot. Well, maybe. Uh, I guarantee you, if you're setting out to make a pair of tongs, and you just envision a pair of tongs in your mind, and you have no forging experience, and you don't know what you're doing, you're going to make a whole lot of mistakes, and you're going to fail a whole lot before you learn to make a pair of tongs. You may give up, you may quit blacksmithing, you may not see it through, you may never know what a good pair of tongs looks like, and you may suffer your entire blacksmithing lifetime with lousy tools because you don't know what they should look like. If you take the time to watch YouTube videos and read books and articles in newsletters, you'll know a lot more about making tongs and you can avoid a lot of those mistakes. You can avoid a lot of those failures. If you take a class from somebody who is an expert at making tongs and they guide you step by step, not only will you have success or more likely to have success, you will understand why you had success. You will understand why this procedure works. You will avoid a lot of the mistakes and when you go home you will be able to make a pair of tongs on your own without making those mistakes. It's a much better process to educate yourself and to learn from those who have come before you. Yes, our ancestors made lots of mistakes. They had to learn without any education. But when you start to move through the ages young aspiring smiths became apprentices. They worked with somebody who showed them how to do it. It wasn't, here's a forge and an anvil, go to work, don't bother me, come see me in a couple of years, I'll tell you if you learned anything. The master and the journeyman smiths in the shop helped teach and guide so that the apprentice did not have to make all of the mistakes every time. Mistakes are inevitable. We're going to have failures, things aren't always going to go right, and that's just something we have to, to accept and to deal with it. And we do learn from that, but don't make that the goal. Failure is not, not the goal of blacksmithing. And some people really seem to make it sound like that's their main goal, is just to screw up as much as possible in hopes that sooner or later they will stumble upon the magic formula. I think you can do better than that. Anyways, that's a bit of a rant, a bit of a ramble. I hope the video was educational. Yes, mistakes are going to happen. Things aren't always going to go right. We're going to get back on the horse. We're going to do it again. We're going to get it right. Uh, we've learned from our mistakes. And maybe the next time we'll actually make that tomahawk. We'll see. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope it was worth something. You can give it a thumbs up. Love it if you hit that subscribe button. Take time to watch some of the other videos that things went a little bit smoother in. And then get out to the shop and make something. Try not to just make mistakes, though. Be safe. Wear your safety glasses. And we'll see you for the next one.